Want to shop Walmart Black Friday deals first? Walmart Plus members get early access to our hottest deals. Join now and get 50% off a one-year annual membership. Shop Black Friday deals first with Walmart Plus. See terms at walmartplus.com. By the time you're finished listening to this Pepsi Zero Sugar, you'll be 15 seconds closer to kickoff. Stock up now. Bengals game day is so close, you can almost taste it. Bengals watching. Better with Pepsi. With Uber Reserve, you can book your Uber ride in advance. 90 days in advance. Perfect for all you forward thinkers and planning gurus. Reserve your Uber ride up to 90 days in advance. Uber Reserve. See Uber app for details. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello everyone and welcome to Rival Week on here on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Harry Sethi. The Reds returned from the international break and navigated what proved to be a tricky away game against Southampton last weekend, extending their lead at the top of the table to eight points, ahead of a huge week in which both Real Madrid and Manchester City arrive at Anfield in search of needed wins. Our attention on this show lies with that latter fixture against Manchester City, who at this moment are in the midst of an unprecedented run of poor form, some calling it a crisis with Guardiola's side having lost five consecutive games in all competitions prior to their capitulation last night in the Champions League, uh, blowing a 3-0 lead against uh, Slot's former side Feyenoord to ultimately draw 3-3. And with the reigning champions without key linchpins absent through injury, whilst former stalwarts look like shadows of their former selves, this Sunday's game against a resurgent Liverpool side promises to be one of Guardiola's biggest tests since arriving in the league. Joining us on the pod to dive into detail around what's to blame for this recent poor run, whether City could turn it around and compete to defend their league title, and what lies ahead for Guardiola, I'm delighted to welcome back Dan Burke from One Football and the Blue Moon podcast. And as always, for those of you listening on the free side of Anfield Index, this pod will cut off after 50 minutes. However, you can subscribe to Anfield Index Pro for the price of a takeaway coffee to get access to the whole show and many others for your listening pleasure. On with the show. Welcome back, Dan. Um, great to speak with you, um, albeit in these kind of strange, strange circumstances, as as we'll get into. How you been? Yeah, very well, thanks. Uh, football aside, yeah, I've, I've got a feeling the uh, the list of figures for this show might perhaps be a little uh, a little higher than usual, maybe a bit of rubbernecking going on from uh, for Liverpool fans, but fair enough, you know, all, all's fair in love and war and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. I think, I think there's, there's always a pretty large um, listenership for this particular conversation because it's. I mean, these, these games have always been so big, and there's always been usually quite a lot riding on them. Uh, and there's been some. There's been some classics over the years as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, you, you're, you're right to start off there. I mean, I think b- b- before we get into talking about what's happening this season, uh, and yeah, kind of the anomaly that we're currently seeing City go through in terms of their recent patch of form and stuff. Um, I, I wanted to go like yeah, straight back to the good times, you know, four times, four times uh, consecutive like Premier League winners, um, uh, talking about sort of the feeling um, at the end of last season. Once again, uh, a bit of a title race. I think you know, Liverpool early on pushing um, and sort of riding that wave of kind of momentum um, that of Klopp's announcement, I suppose, and then I, I think as the physical reality of trying to compete on four fronts caught up with a few of them, faded, and mm-hmm. Arsenal pushed until the final day. But it did seem as though, um, well, I I always viewed it as, as still still pretty comfortable for City, to be honest, and 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 in your own hands, of course. And I, I wanted to ask you, like, sort of how you felt at the end of the season. I've, I've asked you this question before, uh, and you know in similar circumstances how did it feel to win the league again and 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 do all those things but yeah i guess what were your feelings at the end of the season when that final whistle went 
God, it seems so long ago now, you know. It's uh, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to cast your mind back a little bit, really. I mean, I mean, obviously, it was um, it was great. You know, we we never take those um, those title wins for granted. We never take wins for granted at the moment. You know, like that's the position that we're in. Like, it, it would be nice to just win a game again at this point. Never mind a title, but um, yeah, go, going back to last season, I mean, it was. I think people from the outside looking in at City just assume that everything's easy. You know, the word inevitable gets thrown around an awful lot when we win things, which is which is frustrating for the fans in particular. And I'm sure it's frustrating for the, the manager and the players as well to kind of have their achievements kind of, you know, just undermined a little bit in a way or, or, or just sort of passed off as, oh yeah, you know, they spent loads of money. They've got a good team. Of course, they're going to win the league. And, you know, I think the, the period that we're going through at the moment is showing us actually, you know, it, it's a lot harder than people think to to win these these leagues and to be so consistent and to and to maintain this level for so many years and and the drop off has been has been quite severe in in um in recent weeks i know i'm I'm jumping ahead here and, and I will go back to to what 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 the question was about last season um because getting to that point where we won four league titles in a row becoming the first Premier League team to ever do that the first uh, English top flight team to ever do that indeed you know it's a moment in history that that belongs to us and us alone now and it was it was amazing to get that over the line and i think you're right i think it was kind of in the end not easy but i think it, we were in control of it and we never really looked like losing control of it really you know that that game the last time we went to Anfield last I can't remember what it was march april time something like that that was possibly a bit of a sliding doors moment in the season i think in that liverpool actually yeah. battered us that day should have won the game i think you know were it not for Luis Diaz, some some poor finishing from yeah. that day, you, you would have won that game. And then maybe you go on to win the title that year. Maybe we fall away. Um, as it was, Liverpool fell away a little bit. Arsenal ended up being the competitors after they had looked at one point, you know, sort of turn of the year that they were going to fall away. They they did really well to get back into it. Rode us really close in the end, took us to the final day of the season. We had West Ham at home final day of the season and it was a relatively straightforward day in the end. We didn't have an awful lot to worry about on the day, you know, going... One up inside the first two minutes, and and then sort of cruising through the game. It was um, it was one of the easier final days we've had. Won the title, been on the line for sure. And then we had the whole you know FA Cup debacle against United, which was disappointing, but not you know hugely upsetting or life changing event. It was just one of those really where it was like, oh, you know, we we lost the FA Cup and. Never mind. We've won the league again. That was the that was the main the main goal at the start of the season to get that four in a row and. You know, I would have been quite happy last season or I would have understood completely, should I say, if there had been a bit of a drop-off last season, having won the treble the year before. I think it was going to be a lot to expect for City to then go again the following year. I think the fact that they did go and win the league was pretty remarkable and pretty extraordinary. And, you know, I think the players and the manager have built up an awful, awful lot of credit in the bank over the years, which, you know, looking at the current run of form, it, it puts things in perspective, I think, really, what they've done over these four years, you know, you know, going into this season as well, I think you you kind of look at that, that four titles in a row, and and the way I look at it is that every season that goes by, the chances of City winning the league again becomes more and more of a statistical improbability. You know, you can't just keep winning the league every year. It's it's not the done thing in England, for, you know, at least, and in a lot of leagues, it's not the case either. So the fact that we um, started this season quite well. You know, I thought, oh, this is surprising. This is nice. You know, I I might have expected us to to tail off a little bit, having won it four times in a row, and now we're seeing that tail off, uh, obviously. But yeah, I, th- I think the achievement of winning the, the league last year was was fantastic, and just something that we will always be grateful for, and something that I think you know City deserve a lot of credit for. And you know what has happened since then has been a bit disappointing. But as a fan, I'm kind of a bit. A bit calm and a bit relaxed about it because yeah, you know, we, this team has given us so much over the years that it was inevitable. You know, what what goes up must come down eventually, and and, and we're seeing that now. I think. Yeah, no, of course. I think I mean, whenever we have these conversations, and there's there's, given how the sides have sort of sort of vied against each other over the years, I, think I always try and find comparisons with with Liverpool and so what what they went through under under Jurgen Klopp more recently and mm. yeah I can I can remember was it six consecutive defeats or something like that I think when when, when the, there were basically no senior centre backs here and we were just sort of rolling out Matt Phillips and Reese Williams and um, getting turned over by Stoke and Burnley at Anfield and uh, I, I forget what it was but I think there was I, th- I think Virgil van Dijk like lost his 
Invincible's kind of record at Anfield to, I think it was like maybe Burnley or something like that, honestly. Like, well, different to Sam Allardyce, which is, I think, stuck in my, <laughs> in my, in my memory for a long time. But these, yeah, these, these things, these things happen. And then, uh, and then uh, seeing sort of some of the players' legs fall off um, in the 20, probably the 22, 23 season, which is something that we'll come back to actually in terms of sort of like, you know, um, aging greats who'd served the side really well, um, just suddenly everything catching up with them a little bit and sort of understanding that they weren't able to carry the piano in the same kind of way in which they'd done beforehand. And but yeah, as you say, the credits in the bank, you see what they're what they've achieved, what they've done beforehand, and you you cut them some slack. I, I think I, going back to last season, I think the reason why I said it was it seemed I, I wasn't trying to minimize sort of the achievement. I think obviously four four leagues in a row is extraordinary. To show that level of consistency is yeah is 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 remarkable, and I think also that the side had built up some muscle memory. I think over o- mm. over the years in sort of understanding how to go on those runs of fixtures where you just win and you just you just manage games and um, control, which may be absent right now, um, was City's great strength in those um in those runs. But I think I w- I'd always been interested in looking at it, and we've we've spoken as well in the past about. What kind of vintage is the city side? Is it you know, is it like is it like the prime vintage? And um, to me, I think what was interesting over the past few seasons was I didn't really think it was the prime kind of city city necessarily, and I don't think they needed to be because they they built up so much resilience in other ways. Uh, and I remember even speaking to Arsenal fans uh, and friends of mine, and almost saying to them, "Yeah, okay, this 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 is good for you, right? It's it's good to go on a fourteen fifteen win." Um, game run and not win the league because then you start you start to understand just like where the level's been and sort of where that gap still exists right and I think it was it was tough for a lot of Arsenal fans to to um, accept that but I think now that they have and they sort of see what the see what the standard is um, they can be a bit more realistic about where they need to get to and I, I, I suppose the question at the end of last season I suppose you, you've, you've achieved that amazing thing four win- uh, titles in a row yes you have that kind of strange um performance and lost her to, to united in the fa cup everyone thanks you for keeping ten hagen in, in his job for a for a few more months of course uh <laughs> but like when you looked at the squad and you looked at the coach you know and there were discussions about you know is the coach going to move on what did you think was uh, I mean, you're looking at the squad. We can talk about transfers for sure, but I mean, just in terms of keeping that going, you said you were worried after the treble that maybe there'd be a drop off after the quadruple. I mean, what did you think might be needed to keep the side fresh, to keep the side going coming into this season? I mean, that, that's a, a, a conversation that's been had a lot at the moment, really. Like, oh, why didn't City spend a lot of money in the summer? Was it because they are worried about the the one one five charges and and what the effect of that could right. be. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, were, were they sort of saving the money just in case, or you know, didn't want to bring in a load of new players and then have some situation where there's like a relegation and and suddenly everything's everything's chaotic? Or was it a case that they looked at the squad with perhaps a bit of complacency and perhaps a bit of just like loyalty to the players of what they've done and sort of said, well, come on, you know, look at it on paper. It's still a really good squad arguably the best squad in the league and you know I still think that now when everyone's fit you know it's a really good squad that we've got there's not really any any sort of glaring deficiencies with it when everyone's when everyone's fit and firing and that and that's been a you know a big problem that I'm sure we'll come on to a a little bit later on but the the fact that the squad wasn't really freshened up over the summer I think there was the debate to be had about whether that was necessary and now you know the situation we're in now it's like oh yeah it was necessary I can't really say that because at the time I was quite happy going into the season Mm -hmm. with with the squad that we had you know they they brought Gundogan back which was you know with the benefit of hindsight perhaps a little bit of a weird transfer at the time it felt like a no-brainer really it's like you know this guy who was our our captain in the treble winning season who played for us for seven years before who was really really consistent a really outstanding footballer had gone away to Barcelona for a year and by all accounts been one of, if not their best players, had played pretty well for Germany at the Euros. You know, he's he's 34 now, but he he, he looked last season and, and over the summer like he still had plenty left in the tank and to bring him back and the experience he brings, the kind of goal threat that he brings, the that muscle memory that he has of popping up in important moments and scoring important goals was like, yeah, let's get him back. Why not? Absolutely. You know, the, even a figure in the dressing room as well, right? In terms of sort of, yeah, completely. You know, leader. Completely. And then the other player they brought in was Savinio, who has looked pretty good for the most part, but hasn't scored a goal yet and seems to 
with every passing game, get further and further away from scoring a goal somehow. It seems like his confidence is just not quite there at the moment, but he looked pretty good for, for Girona last season and, and scored quite a few goals for them. So I'm pretty sure in a year or two, he'll be a, an outstanding player. Uh, but right now it's just, you know, it's not quite there yet. It, it often does take a little bit of time for these players to bed in. Now for that to be the only summer transfer activity, which, you know, again, with the benefit of hindsight, it looks a bit crazy and it looks a bit like, well, what were you thinking? Did you not think that this this squad refresh was needed and I think I think you know the next two transfer windows are going to be really important for that and and City are going to have to go into the pockets and and spend some money and, and really bring in some players because it's a very it's a creaking gate now the team you know it's 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 struggling there are there are sort of glaring deficiencies that have become apparent this season especially in the absence of Rodri and, and the players that have had to fill in for him are just you know nowhere near his level really and and the, and the team is is much worse off with that key cog removed from from the machine really so um it's been it's been difficult in that respect but i kind of understand why they why they did it whether why they went into the season with this squad and and the way they started the season was was pretty good you know they they had to play without rodri for a few games because he was injured his first start his first premier league start of the season was against arsenal in that game that he he got the the ACL injury and was ruled out for the rest of the season. Up to then, it looked like they'd kind of found some solutions for playing without him with um, with Kovacic playing in there. You know, they looked all right the first few weeks of the season. They, they were at Chelsea away on the opening day. They they beat Ipswich. They beat Brentford. You know, Harlow was on fire. Everything was going, was going really well. But at the same time, there was this feeling, this lingering feeling that I had, and I'm sure a lot of City fans had, that we were just kind of getting by. We were just scraping through some games. You know, we we beat Wolves away with the, the benefit of a last-minute goal from John Stones. We beat Fulham 3-2 when we were quite poor and they had loads of chances. And there was a sense that like there was a bit of an implosion coming. I didn't think it was going to be quite as big an implosion as the one that it has been in the last few weeks, in the last, last month or so. But I, I had a feeling that, hang on, there's a bit of a problem here that, that our results are going to, I got to change soon. Our, our 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 performances and results aren't really matching here. We're kind of we're kind of getting a little bit lucky in some of these games, and it's gonna you know the other shoe's gonna drop at some point, and and things are gonna go quite wrong. But then another sort of you know preseason suspicion that I had was that if anybody was going to take advantage of that, and if anybody was going to be the next in line to the throne, it was going to be Arsenal. I didn't really expect Liverpool to be as good as you have been this season. You know, I think with with Slot coming in as a new manager, and you know you're not really freshening up your squad and, and you know you look at Liverpool's squad now and you think oh wow what a, what a great bunch of players they've had you know there was perhaps a time towards the end of last season when it looked like Liverpool really needed a massive overhaul and and you know with a new manager coming in that's that's usually what happened it, it didn't happen and, and maybe there's something to be said for for continuity on your end that we're just not really seeing with um with City at the moment which is which is kind of weird and, and now Liverpool look fully like the team to beat you know the, the results have been excellent bar that one slip up against Forest and you know, I, I would be at this point quite surprised if he didn't go on to, to win the league quite comfortably. But, you know, a lot can change, obviously, and we'll we'll see what the, the, the coming weeks have to offer. But I think it's been quite interesting that Arsenal haven't really sort of capitalised on City's drop-off. And, you know, despite our recent results, they're still, at the time of recording, behind us in the table. Um, that might change pretty soon, but it's it's um, it's been and, and you know it's it, it's pretty early days in the season as well. I think it's fair to say you know we're still just over a quarter of the way through the season. Things can change, but you know the way things are going, I, I don't think that we've prepared ourselves in the best way possible for this season. I think we should have maybe brought in a few more players over the summer. We should have we should have added a bit of a bit of padding, a bit more depth to the squad. You know that's the thing that gets talked about with with Guardiola a lot that he likes a small squad. You know he likes to keep everyone playing regularly on the toes and and, and not have to di- disappoint players too much. But I think the way that football is going with so many more games added to the calendar every year, it's going to, there's a situation where developing where you can't work with a, a small squad, it just doesn't work anymore. You do kind of have to have that almost like two world-class players in every position so that when when you do get a bit of an injury crisis, you can you can absorb it. But, you know, that's just one of those things. It's been it's been a bit of an underplayed crisis, I think, for City with, with the injuries. And we don't do a lot of complaining about injuries. We tend to just kind of get on with it. And we, we don't get a lot of sympathy from other teams because, you know, we've spent a lot of money and, and that's fair enough, I think. But, you know, we, we've had a big problem with injuries and players not being fit this season and key players not being fit and, and you know, Rodri's just, just one of them really. So that's been a big problem for us and um, maybe something that we could have ensured against by by doing a bit more business in the transfer window. But, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, I think, and, and going into the season, I thought we I thought we were in pretty good shape. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. 
Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first, like you know to check the date of the big game first before you accidentally buy tickets on your 20th wedding anniversary and have to spend the next 20 years of your marriage making up for it. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. The holidays are here at the Home Depot, so let's get to decorating. Find your perfect tree in our huge assortment of shapes, sizes, and styles. Like the easy-to-assemble Jackson Noble Fir, with pre-lit branches perfect for styling with all your favorite ornaments. Or the Flock Starry Light Fraser Fir, with over 1,900 pre-lit memory wire branches that keep their shape so it's ready right out of the box. Ooh. Find the perfect tree now at the Home Depot. The number one selling product of its kind with over 20 years of research and innovation. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super-fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes, and games consoles. Visit LibertyShield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I saw you comment on it yesterday around uh, uh, always refreshing to be criticised for not spending money, <laughs> for being criticised for spending too much money, yet you can't really... You can't really win, and and, and and there's a lot of hindsight in this uh, in, in terms of the analysis and people trying to sort of figure out what went wrong. And uh, it, interesting when you mentioned there sort of uh, the the loyalty aspect of it as well, in terms of sort of there being there being these kind of generals on the side who have achieved like tremendous things for for Manchester City, and it's sometimes hard to predict when um, either either they're going to physically start to decline a bit more rapidly than you expect, or as you just mentioned there, just maybe just not be around as often, you know? And so like, even, even though they might not have declined hugely in terms of their quality, they're just not able to put together 10, 15 games runs in terms of availability, which is obviously the most important, important quality you can have as a, as a football player, no matter how wonderful you are in terms of actually when you get onto the pitch. And I, I, I thought the one thing is kind of interesting because I, I, I I didn't expect Liverpool to be where they are at this at this point, and I, I think I fully agree with you that it's still lots of plenty of the season to go, uh, and there's still lots of work to be done. Of course, you you welcome the position that you're in, and and, and try and try and extend that lead as much as you can, and, and just use the buffer, and then you go, okay, what's well, great? Well, then even if things start to go wrong, we've got we've got a bit of this buffer. But uh, I I had thought from from looking at Arsenal. And from looking at yourselves, the the, the the one thing I could see in some of these games, maybe I was just reading into it or whatever, wanting to see it, but it it seemed as though I mean, it, it, you're both sides for whom control is really important and 
there'd been this ability that you'd had to to get ahead in games and then sort of coast, uh, not not coast, but like have those 20, 25 minute spells at least in games where the intensity could drop and you'd just manage the game. Uh, some of those players you know, might not have to go through the, the same kind of intensity that they're de- that they may be going through right now. There's less stress because you're not you're not having to fight till the very last minute to get that last minute equalizer um, or last minute winner. Uh, and it was something that was very absent from Liverpool last season. Actually, for, for, for all the early season heroics where we were sort of competing with yourselves, it was it was a lot of last minute winners. Right, it was a lot of coming from behind. It was a lot of hair on fire. Oh look, you know. Look at these heroics, and I was worried. That, like, can, can you can you do that forever? And it proved obviously that, that 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 you can't. But also the the kind of mental stress that it puts on players, as well as physical stress, to have to be in that state of okay, we, the game's still not safe. It's still not safe. We have to we have, we have to find a way to win this or get it over the line. Mm-hmm. And that's just not something that I'd seen City have to really yeah deal with for a long time. Right? Would you say that's been like? what you've seen more this season or is that, is, is that just me reading into it? No, that's completely fair. Yeah. I mean, I think in that final game, you know, for for a lot of yeah, the game, they yeah, looked yeah. a little bit better at doing that. In that. And I think one of the reasons was that Grealish played. And Grealish is, you know, he divides opinion a little bit because his goal threat is not, is almost non-existent. You know, he barely scores any goals. He doesn't assist that many goals either. What he does out is someone who can keep the ball really, really well and adds that element of control. And he, it was him on the, the left and Bernardo Silva on the right wing against Feyenoord. And it looked like it was kind of working okay. There was a few hairy moments in the first half, but you know, they go 3-0 up early in, the, early in the second half and you think, right, game over. Guardiola makes a few subs. It's like, you know, we'd never lose or drop points or, or anything, you know, concede three goals like we did in that game from this position. It just doesn't happen. We, we're so good at seeing games out. Guardiola has said in the past, when he's been asked, like, why don't you use your subs bench so much? And he's been like, I don't need to, because our plan is to go, you know, pick up, get two, three goals in front, and then we rest We rest on the ball, basically. We rest during the game. Um, and that has been the sort of recipe for success over the years. But Rila has been out a lot this season. We've had to use Savinio and Doku as the wingers at times, who are a bit more kind of get the ball, try and run up players, lose the ball a lot more often you know, take more risks. That's been that's been a problem. I think the loss of Rodri has been really massive to that as well. Rodri isn't necessarily the kind of defensive midfielder who goes around putting in massive tackles. He does have that in his in his locker, but I think what he adds really is just someone who can sort of keep the ball, get the ball under pressure, not lose it, you know, draw the odd, uh, sorry, or, or make the odd tactical foul, let's be honest. You yeah. know, that's something he's been very good at and, and avoided booking some of the years for that and yeah. stuff and, and breaking up play and, and, we just that don't kind of have screening role, that kind of screening role. Exactly, just, yeah. yeah. We don't have that in the team at the moment and, and there's nobody else who's able to really replicate that in terms of the ground Roger can cover, in terms of just the stability he brings to the team. It's just it's just not there. You know, it, it, even sort of like Rodri was really good at kind of hoovering up the second ball. So the ball goes into the box, defender yeah. clears it, it comes out to the edge of the box, Rodri gets it, we've got the ball again, we keep him pinned back. Now the def- defender clears it, more often than not it goes to another opposition uh-huh. player. and then the turnovers there they're on the attack and we're in trouble then that's happening a lot like a worrying amount and, and you know that's a huge concern going into the game on Sunday as well because because uh, Liverpool are obviously really good at exploiting that kind of thing so yeah the, when you look at the stats you know we're, we're still dominating possession we're still making lots of passes but there's just little bits to our game that have been fundamental to the game over the years that are just not there at the moment and what's been a little concerning and a little disappointing for me is that Pep hasn't really adapted to that situation it seems and, you know, to the untrained eye, I would say, because we don't know what's going on in the team meetings. We don't know what, what tactics he's, he's deploying sort of, you know, below the surface. We can only really see what's going on above the surface. But it looks very much like it's just sort of like, let's just try and figure this out with the same st- system that we usually use and hope that it'll just click at some point and hope that something will happen. And really, I would maybe like to see an extra body in the field somehow or just someone who can help us legislate for the fact that we've not got Rodri there and just kind of make up for that and it's it's been a real problem you know we're, we're conceding big chances in every game we're conceding more goals than usual the defense has has been exposed but you know we haven't been defending well either so there's just a litany of problems really and Rodri is a big symptom of it I think but he's not the only reason and I, and I kind of have a have a feeling that even if he'd been fit 
that we might have struggled a bit this season, that he, even he might not have been able to sort of go another season where he just sort of patched everything up. I think we were a bit over-reliant on him. And I think even that might have might have sort of fallen away a bit and he and we might have struggled even with him in the team this year. So yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of problems at the moment. Control being the main one, but also we're just not really, you know, Haaland has been the, the only real player that's chipped in with goals this season. He's had a few patches where he's 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 not scored. You know, he's gone a few games without scoring. Um Foden, who was, you know, the best player in the league, voted last season and has not been there this season. He's just not on it. He's just he just looks like his confidence is a bit shot. Um, we've seen a few flashes, but it's just just not, not quite been there. You know, like I, I sort of mentioned with Gundogan, he's he he looks his age. You know, he he's come back and it, in a way that you could almost forgive him for if it was his first season at the club. You know, it usually takes time for players to bed in a little bit, but I think we expect him to come back in and just hit the ground running and pick up where he left off. And it's not been the case. He looks he looks like he's struggling a little bit and. Yeah, no, I, w- I wouldn't say there's anybody in the squad you'd identify as someone who's had a really good season. Like maybe Guardiol has been good. Um, he has been at times, but then I think in the last two games, he's given away four goals with like unforced errors, which has been a real worry. Um, we've had like, the likes of John Stones and Ruben Diaz coming out of the team due to injury. Kyle Walker looks like a word beginning with F. The family-friendly version is finished, but there's probably another one that I could use as well. To be honest, he looks like he's well over the hill now. Yeah. Um, Kevin De Bruyne is, you know, he struggled with injuries as well. He's another one who's like really important to us and and has been in and out of the team and and not played for you know six six to eight weeks properly now. Really, he's, he's coming back into fitness, but doesn't look like he's there yet either. So, yeah, it's it's just been a lot of problems that have sort of sort of come to a head at once. I think really, and um, it's uh, it's quite worrying. Yeah, and it does. It, it's again. I'm just searching for for comparisons and contrasts as well. I'm just thinking about to different iterations of of Liverpool over the years, and I think I think the the, the closest Liverpool ever got to um, Man City's kind of control. I think obviously was that was that title winning season where we would do a similar thing to yourselves in terms of resting on the ball mm-hmm. after getting ahead, and we 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 backed ourselves to be able to defend a one nil lead or not have to go two three four or, or, or whatever, which is Liverpool sides under Klopp had done in the past, and uh, a lot, a lot of that was built on um, the, the the defensive kind of screening of 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 one the 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 running and the pressing of Henderson, and yeah. and then also just I think our our Rodri like player though I think he's, he's I think Rodri's a superior player of course is um was Fabinho, and I I, I think many Liverpool fans came to the conclusion that when we got to the twenty two twenty three season. You suddenly saw, oh, hang on, we've been asking Fabinho to do probably a lot more defensive work than we've actually been aware of, and then all of a sudden he can't quite physically get about the way which he was doing and screen the way which he was doing, and it, it, it also came in the same season where I think one Adam had left by that stage, so there wasn't he wasn't doing the screening work, and Henderson, his kind of key quality, his his energy, his ability to get about the pitch, he wasn't really able to do that anymore as well. And so we found ourselves in that situation a lot like that you mentioned where uh, teams would come to Anfield, teams would play against us and they'd score goals against us that you recognize because you're like, hey, that, that that's, what, that's what we do. <laughs> Hang on, like we yeah. turned the ball over and now we're, we're, we're running with our, you know, we're running back to our own goal and we, we can't handle these transitions. And um, it was because all, all, all of a sudden some of these uh, players weren't able to do the work in which they've done. So I, 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 interested to hear what you said there about Rodri and even if he was here, like, would he have been sort of uh, wonderful enough to be able to sort of mask all these issues? But it, it, it sounds like there's a, a number of players there who may be coming to the end of their cycle. And yeah. um, I, I, I won't lie. I think that the, the, the only tribal thing that will come out of me in this part is like uh, a bit of joy at seeing Carl Walker finally lose the ability to be an, an Olympic level sprinter. It's, Who's who's always there? Because I think it was it was a real source of frustration for me in in so many games. We were like, okay, we've done really well to play through the press here. We got out. Oh yeah, there's that guy who's able to do the shuttle runs. And I I think I saw some data this season as well that yeah, I think he's this is a player who's hit some sort of like I think he's at thirty six. I forget what the actual speed um, measure was, but yeah, yeah, he's basically about ten or so um, clocks below that in terms of the season and, and the top speed he's hit and. That's only natural, right? To see, yeah, some of these players fall back in that way. 
There's a bit of revisionism with Walker, I think, among City fans at the moment, where people are sort of saying he was always crap, and, and he wasn't. No, like, no, no. He, he was a fundamental signing for us in the summer of 2017 when we when we got him. You know, Guardiola's first or second summer in charge when we got the fullbacks in that he needed, and Guardi- and, and and Walker was was excellent for for several years. I think his pace kind of prolonged his career at the top level for maybe yeah, a couple absolutely. of years. The last couple of years, I think it, it it got him out of jail an awful lot and and sort of masked his deficiencies as as a defender. Um, and now now he's lost that. It's like well, you've got nothing else, have you really, mate? Like it's like there's not a lot else to your game that that we're really seeing that is useful to us at the moment. I mean, there was a moment earlier in the season when he got skinned by Adama Traore, which is like okay, that happens. He's he's quick, he's strong. You know, he can run past a lot of players in the world. But there was one last week in the defeat to Spurs for the fourth it was goal. The, it was the Werner one, right? Yeah, and Walker anticipated it and and dropped off because he knew Werner was going to run at him and knew he was quick and he still got skinned and it was like, wow, you really have fallen off, mate. It, it really has gone, hasn't it? So, yeah, he, he was he was taking out the team against Feyenoord and I don't know if we'll see him in the team again anytime soon, really, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if he started at Anfield at the weekend as well because the options that we have to replace him aren't particularly inspiring either at the moment. So that's an area that I think has been neglected in, in recent years as well, the fullback area. I think we've we've leaned a bit too heavily on the likes of Walker, and I think, you know, if not January, then summertime, they probably need to bring in a fullback in on both sides, I would say. Yeah, so I suppose like going towards this recent run, and because of course we could talk about some of the more positive um, results early in the season and feel free to bring those up as well. But I, I mean, I usually ask the question around, is, you know, is there is, are there a couple games that kind of encapsulate where you're currently at? And I think just this, the fact that you are on this run at the moment with his, uh, was it sort of, Five consecutive losses followed by that draw last night to Feyenoord, mm. which should have been in any other iteration of City. Hey, we broke the losing streak. That's the you did for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. I think <laughs> I, again, similar memories from Liverpool when you're in that run. Anything, anything is um, is useful. And actually, another thing that I, I remember from that period as well is getting the same impression you're sort of mentioning with 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 Guardiola there in terms of this is the very first time Guardiola have had to deal with this situation in his entire career. Uh, I think it was the same for Klopp. I think at, at that stage as well, where it was like six, seven defeats in a row, or something like that, and uh, how, however many home defeats in a row. And um, you, you're looking at the coach and you're going, you know, this guy's got so many powers, so many ways of finding a way out. And but there were definitely, I, I, I still stand by. There were definitely points in that season where you'd look at him and you go, oh, you don't, you don't actually currently know how to fix this. You're just, you're, you're trying different things. You're trying to see what works, what sticks, and. Maybe trying to get to January. Okay, so okay, what can we do transfer wise? What can we do tactical wise? Um, but it's it's always strange to see a coach that's so you know so acclaimed, so great as as a tactician, like to deal with something that they've never had to deal with before. And I think that's obviously what Guardiola's dealing with at the moment. So much he's scratching his uh, scratching his nose and right is 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 massively frustrated. Um, yeah. If you had to pick again, then I mean, it's, it's it's hard. I guess it's hard to look past the the fire nord one is the there's, there's there's the Tottenham defeat and the manner of that defeat at home but um in in, in this run like uh, 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 is there a particular game that you, that you could point to and go that's like a that's a perfect case study of what's got of what's currently the issues that we're that we're dealing with hey guys it's eddie gives from anfield index here i hope you're enjoying this podcast and i'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends in the current climate it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free at Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full, and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, AnfieldIndexPro.com. Join today. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.